spend as much time as is necessary to correct misconceptions. And the misconceptions of what we've put forth and tried to provide to you. And, you know, it, Regina has been a big help in this. It, it, and, and I guess she stumbles into this, doesn't realize that when somebody opens a suggestion to me, it gets into, it's, you know, it's like set, lighting a match and the next thing you know you got a, a forest fire. Because it alerts me. I never look at any, any time something comes to me or a new subject comes to me, it triggers off in my mind the fact that you better spend some time with this. Because what this means is that there's a misunderstanding. It is not wrong for people to question anything. But it is wrong if I then don't spend time and make sure that everybody is really clear on what's going on here. Because there's evidence that some people are not clear as to where I'm coming from and how we're finding these things. You know, one of the one of the great horrors I think in, in religion and fundamentalism is that is you know they, they wouldn't even discuss these things. And so, to me, it's it's not a sin to discuss these things. It's a dis, it's a sin to be afraid to. And 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 so I wanna I'm, I have no problems with people who think that you know I'm wrong because I reached these conclusions. That's okay. But I I just you know I want to spend as much time as I have to in order to make sure that you understand where I'm coming from and how I arrive at this stuff. And last week, um, we spent a lot of time, you know, in comparing uh, the words Adam and Adam and, and, and how I arrived at the, the conclusion that they're the same thing. And, and then we spent time on the word angle and angel. And it's the same point. But you see, there are people, you know, Regina and I have, I've seen it, the people who express themselves, who feel that the reason I've reached these conclusions is because they look, you know, Adam and Adam seem, they look alike, and Angel and Angle look alike. So, I mean, that would be a logical way for somebody to evaluate why we do this. But what you have to know, and what's very, very important for you to know, because I know you stand and tell somebody where you happen to come or what you saw, and somebody questioned you about this, is that the fact that the words look alike or seem to sound alike is the very last consideration that has nothing to do with, with the reasoning behind you know, why I reach a conclusion that they're the same thing. To me, it has to do with the activity that surrounds each of these particular entities. The activity that surrounds this entity in a book, and the activity that surrounds this entity in science. And when I look at those things, then I start to, to come up with, <laughs> look, if, if I read the book and I read about this atom, and the book says something was taken out of this atom, which was a rib, and then when that happened, there was all of this creation replication. So then when I look at that, and I'm trying to reach a conclusion as to what this could possibly mean. I say to myself, what is it that you can remove something from? And when you remove something from that particular thing, suddenly you have and you cause a chain reaction, a replication, a creation. In other words, when you take something from something else, that something else starts to multiply itself. And when I studied that, I found that when you remove an electron from atom, you have this same replication of creation. So the result, the significance of this was not that the words sound alike at all. The significance was that if you do to this what the Bible says was done to this, you get the same result. Then I said, well, <laughs> inasmuch as this is called splitting the atom, couldn't this be called splitting the atom? 
Go ahead. Annulling an electron is not called slavery. Okay, fine. Fission? That, well, that's not Christian, though. Yeah, okay. Fine. What would you call it? Go ahead. I'd call it uh, changing its balance. Okay, fine. What happens, what happens interestingly, in, in a thing called polymerization? Have you ever heard of polymerization? Polymerization, when you have um, an entity like a catalyst or an initiator, when an initiator works on, uh, say, an ion, when an initiator works on an ion, it then causes this same thing, this replication. So if you were to look at this book and try to say, let me find some logic inherent in this, uh, if I was to look at this literally and say, okay, the logic says that it is not possible to take a rib out of a person and make another person, but it is possible then if you use this case of the electron and the atom, whichever, however you may want to talk about, we can talk about that. But there is possible then for the electron and the atom to cause this replication. And polymerization takes the same thing when the initiator in impacts on the ion and then causes this same type of creation to occur. So, I mean, these, these are ideas, these are suggestions. Nobody can turn around and say, this is what they had in mind. But it's a curious type of thing that occurs in the same way, using the same word. The same thing occurred when I used the word angle and angel. Of course, I should probably put this one on this side. And so what we looked at here was saying then the fact that they, these two words have a little more connection back to the, you know, this root than, of course, atom and atom do. Angle and angel both have a connection in the Latin word angela. So they have a root that originates out of the same place. But again, the point was what is the activity that occurs that we could say, well, could the two be the same? When you look at the word angel in, in the Bible, you're looking at what is described as uh, something that comes from above that impacts on a human being and is a messenger. And, and, and basically, that's, that's, that's what an, an angel is, is, is described as in the Bible. It comes from above, it impacts on a human being, and it's a messenger. Okay. When you look at an angle, and then you find out that all light that comes from above impacts the Earth on an angle, as we've got written here, it impacts the human brain in the form of ATP, which then you know connects with cyclic AMP inside of the body, impacts the human brain, and is described by science as a photon, which is a messenger. Now, so, so, so now we have what we have then we have an angle of light because all light impacts the Earth at an angle. We know that from Dr. Gary Pollard at, 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 at the Goddard Space Lab. All light impacts the Earth at an angle, and it, it's a messenger particle. And according to the Bible, what an angel is is light that impacts the Earth, or something that impacts the Earth from, from above, and is a messenger. So these things, then, are not described as being the same or uh, being relative to one another because they sound alike, but because of the reality of what goes on. What goes on in the context of the story? What goes on in the context of science? In the same way, for instance, if we look, at the, if we look in the Bible, again, and we look in the Bible, and we see the question of the temple. We see that the occupancy of, quote, unquote, God in the temple is in a temple not made with hands. So then we see the temple construction in the Bible is for an outer room, which is the holy place, an inner holy of holies, and the two separated by a curtain or a veil, which is curious because it's, it's, it's presented to us in the Bible as a pattern. So it would be my idea to say, well, a pattern of what? But when you look in the human brain then, you find that the outer covering of the human brain is called dura mater. The most sensitive part of the human brain is the inner part called pia mater. And the two are separated 
by what is called arachnoid, or the veil, or the curtain. So then you have, you, you, you then start to say, maybe Adam and Adam do have a relevance, maybe angel and angel do have a relevance, and maybe this indeed is talking about the structure of the brain. And if, you, and if these things are true, then on the basis of that, you can start gleaning from people that we've seen recently on television, like Joseph Campbell, or we've read of the works of, of the great psychoanalyst Carl Jung, and, and when we start to understand, what are these things? If the Bible itself, the very, very book that we use, says that it's a symbolic book, Jesus never spoke but in a parable, be not a minister of the letter. Galatians 4.24, which things are an allegory, the dark sayings, the hidden meanings, and so forth that it talks about, then it would be incumbent on us if we wanted to at least study these things openly and discuss them. And it's very good to discuss them. It's very good to disagree. The most important thing is to disagree. The, the, the most critical thing is not to be part of a group that says this is the way it is. It's an idea that, hey, let's look. And if there's a question of whether this is right or that's wrong, it can be further explored. But it's still basically somehow going to turn out to be right because we understand that if indeed there was a rib removed or if indeed there was an electron or whatever this thing happens to be, that all life creation comes out of not a spare rib, but all life creation comes out of this replication, this chain reaction. So, so we also have the, the knowledge of a renowned psychologist such as Carl Jung. And, and, but these were, these were men almost like in our, Joseph Campbell certainly was, and Carl Jung uh, certainly was as well. But there were people that predated them. There was the Galileos and the Copernicus and the Giovanni Brunos. There was Rene Descartes. And these were the wise men of, of, of the times of the church of the Middle Ages. And they went to the church and they tried to say, now wait a minute here. What you're saying is the way things are is not the way things are. And, and Copernicus was, was put down for what he had to say. Galileo was in prison. Giovanni Bruno was killed. And Rene Descartes, when he was about to provide his thesis to the world on you know, the danger of this, this group or this tribal mentality type of thing, Rene Descartes was cautioned by, by his associates, hey, you know, the Galileo problem is something that you might want to think about. But Carl Jung, to me, most brilliantly gave us a clue as to how it could be that possibly someone thousands of years ago could be referring to Adam, could be referring to angles of light, could be referring to the construction of the human brain. How could this possibly be written so many thousands of years ago? And Carl Jung said of myths that there are types of the collective unconscious that transfer from the mental sphere or rational to the obscure subliminal. In other words, if you take you know, what he's saying there, then you have an idea, and the idea basically gets delivered into the subliminal in the form of a, in the form of a dream, and then the story comes out of the pen of somebody in these stories, which are in many instances very grotesque stories, the stories of Pegasus, the winged horse, the stories of Medusa, the stories of Bellerophon, and all of these things, which are wild things. And, and, and it's almost as if they come out of the, the dream state, uh, come out of a, a dream state that you and I might experience in our own bodies. Well, well, Carl Jung is saying, that's true, that's exactly where they come from. But it's a dream state of the collective unconscious. In other words, it, it's not unlike the, the hundred monkey theory. I don't know if you've ever heard of the hundred monkey theory, where, where this monkey realizes somehow that if I take this thing and I wash it, uh, you know, it, it's going to be better for me. Well... In the, in the same way, there's monkey on the other side of the earth, and, and he's doing the same thing, and yet the two obviously can't communicate. But there is something born within each. There's something born within that, in that deep subliminal point, the subconscious, that suddenly comes out in the form of ideas or imagination. And then when the, when the, when the, um, when the civilization evolves to a point, evolves to a point of being able to see through experience, the works of the Hubbles and the, and the discoveries and the universe and so forth, you start to s suddenly be able to say, well, maybe we have something. Maybe this is really something relevant. And yet it is so very hard to even discuss these things. And that's all I've 
just suggest that I, I, my problem with, with the current state of religious thought is that it, it limits the idea of, of discussion. It limits the idea of exploration. It, it's, it kind of cuts you off at the point of the dark ages of Europe and says, this is the way it is, and you're not allowed to think any other ways. And that's what happened to the Copernicus types and so forth. So in other words, if we, if we, look, at the, at, at we look at these things, and if we look at the thoughts of Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell, these dark sayings are, are things that came from deep within the inner reaches of consciousness who wrote strange words. Otherwise, you know, what, what is mythology? What is, at, what is parable? What is allegory? What, what are all of these, these methods that were used by the people, especially the people of the East, to convey these very strange messages? You know? So e even though the outer mechanics have changed, I mean, you could take people of three, 4,000 years ago and sit them in room and put clothes on them like you're wearing clothes and cut their hair the way you're and, and be different but the point is the only thing that separates you from them is you have evolved you're in a civilization that has evolved to a point of, of knowledge and science that you can understand things they might have been able to talk about Adam because they didn't know of Adam but you do. And if there's a relevance and if there's a, if, if there's a, a reasonable uh, connection in the story, then you could, you could arrive at a point and say, well, where did all life come from? All life does come from Adam. I mean, there's no doubt about it. We know that. They didn't know that then, but we know that now. Joseph Campbell followed the lead of Carl Jung, and he said, myths and dreams are motivated from a single a psychophysiological source, the human imagination, moved by conflicting urgencies. And, and this is what I loved what Campbell said. He says, as the imagery of a dream is a symbol of the psychological state of the dreamer, mythology is a symbol of the psychological state of the human race. I mean, you know, who am I? I mean, to, to stand and look at a person who taught, it, taught this for 38 years and and, and was able really to conclusively energize uh, us. We should have been energized to start looking at these old stories and say, What's being, what was being conveyed to us so many thousands of years by this collective unconscious? See? So uh, if, if, if we can at least think in these terms, we don't have to reach a conclusion. Nobody has to say, well, you have to believe this. That's stupid. But we can just start talking about it. We can start thinking in terms of this. That a person, we can think that a person can write in mythological terms about an anatomy that hasn't yet been discovered, about astronomy, about cosmic things that haven't been discovered yet. Because deep within the, in, in the subconscious of all of us is the knowledge of these things. So in his book, The Inner Reaches of Outer Space, uh, Joseph Campbell gave the best definition of religion that I've, I've ever read, and I, and I would share it with you. He calls religion misunderstood mythology misunderstood mythology. And he goes on to say the virgin birth, the promised land to be claimed by people chosen by God, the, the term God to be understood as an actual invisible father, someone sitting on a planet who created the universe and, and now the justified will go when they're joined in their resurrected bodies. And Campbell concludes, he says, what in the name of reason or truth is a modern mind to make of such evident nonsense? But, but, but on the other hand, you, you know, if you're like me, when I was a kid, my father, he used to buy me these books, little magazines, and they were the stories of Jules Verne. I don't know if you ever heard of them. 20,000 leagues under the sea. Cosmic things. This guy didn't know about that. But something came out of his imagination. Something came out of his dream state, and he wrote these things that are now absolutely Buck Rogers. What's the big deal? Certainly. Spaceships, you know, which... which which were all fantasy, but they weren't fantasy. They, they, they were somehow the myth of the time. That was one of the things that Joseph Campbell had said. You know, he says, we've, we've lost our myth. He said, the only, the only story, a uh, current story that, uh, that uh, with Joseph Campbell would talk about that he would say uh, was, uh, was, would be con considered a myth, a current myth, a contemporary myth, was the story of Star Wars. And, and it was. And, you know, the, the symbolism there was, was, was tremendous. See? So there's something that lies dormant inside of each of us. I don't know how many of you have ever read the Upanishads. 
of Krishna, but it says, just as those who do not know the spot might pass time and time again over a hidden treasure of gold without discovering it, so do all the creatures of this world pass daily into that Brahma world deep within themselves without discovering it because they're distracted by false ideas, you know. And, and, and how, how true that is. You know, I, I, I guess, as most of you, I was raised, that I was told by the group, by, by the church, by the tribe, this is the way it is. And sometimes as a little kid I would say, you know, I, I can't, I don't understand how you could, how is it? And I was told, now wait a minute, you have faith. That's all you take it on and you don't question it. And, 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 and such a dangerous thing to do. That to question everything. The gentleman questioned my oh fine, that's great, that's the way you understand. I remember remember the time that I was up here talking about the movement of the sun, the trajectory of the sun. And, and we got into a deep study about the trajectory of the sun. I remember Mike Roscoe come up and say, you're wrong. The sun doesn't move. It's the earth moving. And I say, That's true. So we, we, spent, we spent about two weeks clarifying that because I don't, want to, I don't want to say anything that's not right. You know? And I have provided you with pages. Each of you have this. You've got 101 pages of documentation from, from not one New Age source, not one religious source. Everything comes from scientific manuals or, or Stedman's medical dictionary, whatever. So what I'm trying to show you is where I get this stuff from. Now, I can prove anything. But the point is that I can prove the source of the material that I've given to you. See? So we talked about angels of light in the old books instead of angles of light. For such was the dream. We talked about Adam and Adam instead of Atom. But we took the rib, rib from Adam. And such was the dream. Such was the symbolic nature of the dream. We talked about the temple. And we talked about the outer. And we talked about the inner. And we talked about the veil. Because such was the nature of the dream. And, and then, like I, I, I mentioned to you um, a few weeks ago, and we reached the conclusion that Supernova 1987A certainly could be the crucifixion. Not that there was a crucifixion, but I'm telling you, in my humble opinion, it was a myth. But that we're talking about the crucifixion strangely occurs in Golgotha, which is the skull. It strangely occurs on Mount Calvary. And if you look at Stedman's medical dictionary, Calvaria, which is Calvary, is the dome part of the skull. So the crucifixion happens in the skull. Well, using that as a basis, since that's what the Bible said, if the crucifixion happens in the skull, could the two thieves who were crucified with Christ be the two eyes which deceive us and steal from us, and the Christ be the center eye, the single eye, the pineal? And if that's so, then could this be the crucifixion? Could Supernova 1987A be the crucifixion looking down upon us, given to us in a myth to herald the coming of a great astronomical event, which we're seeing now? And then the amazing thing occurred, because in the Bible it says of the crucifixion, and when it had occurred, the veil in the temple was split in two. And what did I give you? I gave you in, in the material that was under uh, number 101, page 1, from San Diego, Associated Press, June 10th, 1998. Paul Resser, Associated Press, astronomers cracked the curtain. Astronomers for the first time have cracked a curtain of interstellar dust known as the zone of avoidance that blocks Earth's view of a fourth of the universe. So is it possible? Is it possible then that this is the crucifixion and then the curtain being torn is indeed the opening of, of, of the entry into a fourth of the universe? You know what they did as soon as the curtain was torn? They saw 103 galaxies that they never knew had existed before. When did that happen? didn't happen in the Middle Ages. It happened June 10th, 1998. So we have spent, I don't know if you have, but basically I guess most of us have, we, we spent our, our lives, haven't we, talking about going to heaven. Amazing. We've even created a story about a real city. I was raised with the fact that, you know, the people that died have all gone up and they're in this city. They're all going to heaven if they're good. Or, or I remember my father, he was an interior decorator at Macy's. and In fact, he created the first uh, floats for the Thanksgiving Day parades. That was very true. He created the very first floats. For Thanksgiving. Joan and I, we have still some horses in our house. You can see if you come in there. 
that were part of the displays at Macy's back in the 1930s. But I remember when he died, I'll never forget uh, somebody coming in, a religious person. I was a little kid sitting there, and um, he had committed suicide, as you know. But anyhow, they came in, and they were, they were talking about a casket, and they were saying, God needed an interior decorator in heaven. And, I, I, and the first thing that I thought to myself was, man, the one thing I don't want to be is an interior decorator. You know, I, I don't want to follow in his footsteps. But I mean, you know, th th this kind of stuff that we, we dream up to justify these things. So we say, we're going to go to heaven. Well, where is it? And how are we going to get there? And, it, you know, and I'm going to show you some interesting things. And you can play with them. You just play with this stuff. It's not going to change. It's not going to have my charge in anything. And you don't have to, you don't have to, you don't have to do anything I'm just to play with these words. What's the problem with that? So we're going to go to heaven. Okay. It's an interesting word. But where is it? In Luke 17, 21 in the Bible, there's a direct. Now, I've got to use the Bible. This is all I've got. I mean, I, you know, I've used the, the books of Krishna, and I've used the books of Buddha, the sutras, and the Vedas, and so forth, and I've dabbled in the Koran, and I've looked at some of these things. And, and, and in, in each group, there's a, in the Jewish groups, there's the Kabbalists who think the way I do. In the Christian groups, there's the mystics who think the way I do. And in, and in the, you know, in, in Buddha and so But dabbling in these various books, I use the Bible, and the Bible stipulates where this is. It says in Luke 17, 21, the kingdom of God, which I am assuming is heaven, is within you. Okay. So now it's, if it's in you, then it's either going to be in your gallbladder, in your pancreas, in some other unmentionable places, or it's going to be in your head where all this stuff goes on. And I'm considering that it's going to be in your head. And I think that that is an unreasonable position to take. I, 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 don't, I don't think if, if in some of the other places, I don't think you and I want to go. But if heaven is in the head, then it opens up a whole thing because remember, Golgotha, the crucifixion, and so forth, all of that's in the skull. So maybe we can look at this. So anyhow, the word intrigued me. The word heaven intrigued me. The abode of God. Inside, within you, the abode of God. And like this one, the dwelling place of angels, angles of light entering through the pineal gland. Ah, hitting cyclic AMP, causing a second messenger syndrome inside of me. An eternal state of communion. Heaven from the old English, H-E-O-F-O-N, from the Germanic. Now watch this one. This is really neat. From the Germanic Hibbit, Albert means the vault of God. Hibben, the vault, the stony vault of God. Now, what's so interesting? Does anybody know why that's interesting? Nah, I didn't think you would, but you should. Okay, let me show you where. If you look on page 56 of this stuff that I've given you, and on page 56, there is information from various places, including Stedman's Medical Dictionary, but at the very top... You look at, made, at Matthew 27, 60, and it said, The great stone to the door of the sepulcher. That's the tomb where Jesus rose from. A burial vault. Now, right underneath that word that says a burial vault is the word fornix. Fornix of the brain is vault. Okay? And the fornix is in the center of your brain. And it attaches to the pineal gland of the brain by something called stria pinealis. When the energy opens up the pineal gland of the brain, and this is the concept, the energy then rolls along the stria pinealis where it blows open the vault. Now, in this particular case in the story, what happens? The sun comes out, the stone is rolled away, and Jesus comes out. Here I am. Okay, great. In the concept of Stedman's, and you'll find in the medical dictionary, when the energy from the pineal gland, the electrical energy from the pineal gland, flows along that line called stria pinealis, it impacts at the fornix, and then the concept is that the vault opens and the Christ comes out and enters into your head. There is nobody in your head named Jesus. There is nobody in your head named Christ. These are all electrical principles, and these principles are described in allegory and myth in the same way that the principles surrounding the movement of the cosmos are explained in allegory and myth. But anyhow, I thought that was interesting because Hibben 
which is a, a, a German word for heaven, means the vault. And the fornix of the brain is definitely in the vault. And this is the interesting part of the fornix of the brain. What do you call Jesus in the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 3, 14? Call him Amen. It says, thus saith the Amen. And what have you said every time you've gone to church and somebody said a prayer? And all the people said Amen. And then when you look in here, in this stuff that I gave you for nothing, you look on page, for nothing, you page 11. And it talks about the fornix on page 11. And it says, at its upper and interior part, immediately behind the anterior, which is the front pillars of the fornix, in front of the aptic thalamus is an opening. And what's the opening called? For a man, F-O-R-A-M-E-N. That's interesting to me. That's right. That's, a for, that's exactly right. It is opening throughout the body. The, all the openings are called for a man. That's exactly right. And the opening of the fornix, which is the vault, is for a man. What I particularly like is that. But now let me show you another word that I found that is interesting. That has to do with heaven. In the Old Testament, it says, if you want to get to heaven, you cannot have any leaven. If you want to get to heaven, you got to drop your leaven. You can make a song out of that. But it's true. That's what it says. No leaven. You can't have any leaven if you want to get to heaven. Now, leaven is an agent such as yeast, and it causes fermentation. It causes the dough to rise. It's something that comes from the outside, agitates, causes a fermentation, but causes the dough to rise. And when I looked at the word fermentation and, and, and the description of it, it's called unrest, agitation. So we have a place inside of us called heaven. And we have also Leaven, which is an agent introduced to us from the outside, which causes agitation, which causes unrest. And if we want to be able to get to heaven, what do we got to do? We got to get rid of the leaven. And we get rid of the leaven how? In the same way that the Bible describes. If your eye be single, if you enter in within yourself, if you separate from the external thoughts, if you practice the single eye, and if you do those things, then you're rejecting the leaven, and then your way is clear to go to heaven, which we are considering to be that which is consciousness. Even in the Bible, now, in the, um, in the, in the, in the words of the uh, Hindus and the Kundalini, you rise through seven chakras in the spine in order to make it to the pineal gland and then to the fornix. In the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 5, 1, it's seven seals. If you remember that guy out in David Koresh out in Texas was working on the sixth seal. Thank God he didn't make it. Uh, when, of course, this was a misinterpretation because he was literalizing the fire. Instead of understanding it as solar plexus energy rising up to the brain, he was considering actual fire, and, and, and that's what most religionists unfortunately do. But it says here in Exodus 12, 15, you shall eat unleavened bread seven days. So then if we understand in meditation the energy rising through those seven seals to impact the pineal gland on sphere pinealis to the fornix, then we could say, well, there may be a connection here. That seven and this seven rising up here to that place of the fornix or the vault to heaven. So the, the elimination of, of, of what you call leaven. It says here then in Matthew 16, 6 also, Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And when he was talking about the agitation and the unrest that enters into your mind from the religious people. Now, let's, let's play for just a minute here because there's something interesting. If we, if we get out of the ancient words and the origins of these words, but we go into the English words, it's interesting too. Because if you look at the word heaven, you'll find it has its roots in the word heave. And what's heave mean? Lift up. Heave. Oh, push up. Leap. Or it also means throw up. That, that's what you were thinking of. Yeah. And it's exactly what it means. It means to lift up, to raise, to haul up an upward movement. And an important derivative of that word is haven, which is a place of rest, a place where we can be secure, a place where we can run from the outside, 
Uh, so if indeed, if the Bible says the kingdom of God or heaven is within us, then we reach it by the act of raising or lifting. The Bible itself says the kingdom of God is within. So heaven is within. Now we look at the root of that word, and we realize it's saying heaven lift up. Raise up. And we go into the meditation process. We raise the energy from the lower to the higher. Okay? Um, there's, a, there's a statement that says in, in 1 Corinthians 5, 6, Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old lump. So I, I, I was fascinated by that, finding that heaven, the word heave, and so we constantly are heaving. <laughs> we are constantly heaving in meditation. We are lifting the energy up to that higher realm of consciousness, which is, you know, the Golgotha factor. But what I wanted to do then, I looked at the word leave, you know, and I looked at, in looking at the word leave, I saw something interesting. Uh, leave it has, is, is the root of the word leaven. And it means... To go away from, to quit, to remove oneself, to stop, to cease. And leave also means permission, giving somebody else permission to do something. In other words, uh, here, uh, you go ahead and, and uh, take my leave. You, you go ahead and do it. But so I think that if we were just to look and play with these words, heaven, that place inside of us which we re reach by pushing up the energy in our form of meditation, and the fact that we cannot have an 11, that we cannot quit. This is an ongoing process. Because we may be striving towards the inner concept of heaven and consciousness, but as soon as we quit, it's like taking your finger out of the dike. You know, the water is going to start pouring back in. So you see how important words can be, and even how they can open up. I mean, um, what I would just say to you, if we use the Bible itself, and they says that heaven is a place inside of us, then lifting ourselves up inside of ourselves would seem to be more logical than waiting until we die to fly off to some city on a planet somewhere. So, I mean, you know, then we say, well, gee, that, that seems reasonable. So, does that seem to make sense rather than the city in the sky? And then we realize that it's not the sounds of words that make the comparison. I'll show you something. When I look at angles of light and angels of light, I look at that activity. And let's just do this final exercise and we'll leave this and we've got to go on to the seals. I understand that. But if you look at this material that I gave you on 14i, I want to show you something. And, and, and it's quite interesting and just something else you can take a look at. And the whole premise of this being that if we're willing to look and to study and not to use religious documents for our proof, not to use New Age documents for our proof, but to use science and to use the intellectual documents of encyclopedias and so forth. But if you look at 14i, okay, you see there the word angel, okay? And you see that the word angel comes from the Latin angelus. Do you see that? Do you, is anybody looking at this? Okay, angel. You see number five in formal dentistry, both from the late Latin angelus. You see that? Now, right below that, you see the word angle. You see the word angle? And what does it say there in the fourth sentence? From angel. You see that? Angle from angel. And if you look way at the bottom of angle, all the way down at the bottom, it says from the Latin angelus. So then we have words that have a significant uh, uh, similarity in their roots. Now, let me, let, me just, let me conclude this by telling you, how many of you know what a fish is? Okay, Dave raised his hand. I, I, <laughs> I want to make sure you know what a fish is. Okay, now, if you know what a fish is, what is, what is a fish, what, when you eat fish, what is it supposed to, what's the traditional thing when you eat fish? It's brain food. Isn't it brain food? Huh? Well, that's what I was told when I was a kid. Eat your fish, and I hated that stuff because fish was brain food. But let me show you. If fish is brain food, all right, let's then say that we're going to you know, stimulate the brain. We're going to stimulate the consciousness. We're going to stimulate the mind. We're going to go up and we're going to get new concepts. Let me show you something in the Bible. If you look on page 590 of the Bible, it's a very interesting thing. In the book of Isaiah, 
in Isaiah chapter 19.8. And, and remember, as I've always told you from the very beginning, I don't want you believing any of this stuff. I'm not asking you to believe any of this stuff. All I'm trying to do is stimulate you to go looking. And if I've stimulated Penny to be looking on the Internet and she's finding things, or if I've stimulated Regina to share these things with people and to get into conversations and discussions about them, something good will come from that. It's the unstimulation of sitting there accepting blindly mythology as literalism that is very dangerous. Okay. So any, if I look in Isaiah chapter 19, and we looked at this word angle, and we looked at the word angel, and we're talking about how do we catch fish. And in the Bible, metaphysically, and you'll have to go to the Joseph Campbells and the Gaskells of the world, fish mean God. Remember when, 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 when Jonah was thrown overboard? Jonah is you and me. And until we stop steering our boat and trying to run our own life, and until we're ready to jump overboard and sink into the abyss where we are totally helpless, only at that point, in that deep abyss of meditation, can we be swallowed by the fish. That's exactly right. He was thrown overboard simply because he was accused of being the one who was not able to, uh, who was causing the problems on the ship. But the thing that threw Jonah overboard, the people that threw Jonah overboard, are symbols of the thoughts of the mind, the cast overboard. Because you know, we are thrown overboard when we simply are no longer able to, to, to manipulate that, that thing, the vehicle, which is our system. And only in that, but the, the key to it is, only in that state when we are helpless can we be swallowed by the fish? And of course, then when he's thrown out of the fish, he becomes this, this smart guy. This is the point I want to make. In, in, in Isaiah chapter 19, verse 8, the fishers also shall mourn, and all they that cast angle into the brook shall lament. They spread their nets and so forth. Interesting. They cast angle, but some of them are not catching anything. Now, in Habakkuk 115, which is on page 759, it says they take up all of them with the angle. They catch them in the net. These take up the angle and catch them in their net, which is the web or arachnoid. You see, the point that I'm saying to you is I do not myself, and I am speaking for myself, not for you, believe that there is one word in this book that is literal, not one, that the whole thing is mythology. We have a Jewish Messiah with a Greek running around Palestine surrounded by Peter, Paul, and Mary, all of the Englishmen, and we are expected to literalize this thing. Obviously, you can't do that. And yet, on the other hand, we have people of the, of the, of the caliber of a Joseph Campbell or Carl Jung, and we understand these great myths, these great documents that were handed down to us. And so we then look from the collective unconscious to see, is there a message for us? And we've read about the single eye. And it says in the Bible, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. And the single eye is supposed to be the third eye between the two. And then suddenly we see this explosion in the universe that Hubble shows us there indeed is a single eye in the heavens looking down upon it. And so then we simply say, could this be? Could all of this have been symbolic language talking about anatomy and astronomy given thousands of years ago? Is there a connection with this? They may say, say, well, I don't believe there is. But that's fine. But at least you thought about it. That's all. That's all you could totally neglect it. But then you're left, folks. You're left with the fact that you got two people there in the Bible that didn't know they didn't have any shorts on talking to a snake. And the snake said, I don't think you've got any shorts on. You're left with that. That's fine. Or you're left with this guy that got swallowed by a fish and a fish... The fish puked and out come an evangelist. You're left with that. That's fine. Or you're left with another guy that took two of every kind of animal. Fleas, ticks, everything onto a boat. Everything was on there. Elephants. You imagine having two elephants on your boat for 40 days? You're going to clean up that? But see, if this is where you want to go with logic, that's fine. And if, if, if that's what this book is, then why waste our time? But on the other hand, if mythology is something to be understood, and if there is a collective unconscious, and if deep within the right hemisphere of the collective unconscious lies the truth from the earliest of times, then it can be coming out. So then it's, it, it's, it's those to think of. So I would suggest to, to those of you who, who would like to see something about this, there's a book called The Dictionary of Scripture and Myth by G.A. Gaskell. I would suggest that you buy it. Take a look at it. I mean,
man that, that spent his whole life in England defining all of these ancient words in, 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 in Buddhist, in Hindu, in Islam, and, and, in, and in Christianity. It's an excellent book and, and showing what these people intended to convey, as Campbell did. You know, I, I would, con uh, in the beginning of, of Joseph Campbell's book, the dictionary, uh, excuse me, in the beginning of Gaskell's book, The Dictionary of Scripture Myth, there's this quote from Max Muller, and I want to read it to you. Unless we learn to understand this metaphorical language of the ancient world, we shall look upon the Upanishads and on the most sacred books of the East as mere childish twaddle. In Gaskell's book, it, it says here, and I would like you to really think of this, it says, for a universal language such as this could not be invented and applied by man. It is possible for the scriptures literally to be the work of man, but it is impossible for their worldwide undermeanings to be other than superhuman and transcendental. It is the collective consciousness. It is the hundred monkey. It is a truth that has been encoded into the subconscious of all life from the time of the very first human foot to touch the earth. And so you have novas, you have hubbles, you have scientific discoveries, and all of these things astound us with their wonder. You have quantum. You have, you, you're beginning to understand, as, as you have in your documents there, that you cannot die, that nothing can die. They, on December 11th, 1997, in Innsbruck, Austria, and you have it, I think, on page 100, Dr. Anton Zellinger and his group killed a photon, destroyed it. You have the whole thing there in your book. And what happened after the photon died? It appeared three feet away. Here it's over here. Beep, 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 beep. Bad. Dead. And they look over and hear, beep, 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 beep. It's true. And I said to Dr. Zellinger, and you can read about it in your stuff. Could this possibly happen with a human being? He said, theoretically, yes, but we're so primitive. But he said, not only can you teleport three feet, you could teleport from one galaxy to the other. Forget the speed of light. And in quantum physics, here you are with the electron, with the photon, and it splits, and one's going out this way, and the other's going out that way. And they get light years apart. And one runs into something. Bang, it stops. This will stop. One changed from clockwise to counterclockwise. This will change from counterclockwise to clockwise. They have no connection. They have no relationship to each other. They're millions of light years apart, yet they're one. And so you're learning these things in quantum, things that caused Einstein to throw up his books and says, I quit. And Niels Bohr go to Einstein and said, Doctor, we need you. He said, I can't, I can't, I can't deal with this. Because I always said God doesn't roll dice, and you're telling me, don't be so sure. When you think you know, you, when we think we all, oh, we know what things are because we have scientists. You've got books. You've got scientific books. What are you going to do with your books now that two weeks ago or three weeks ago they said there's water on the moon? <coughs> what happens to the books? Where's all the relevance then of all of the things? Because now we're finding out all things are new. What's the relevance when you look at the universe and say, my God, we can see, and then you find out you're only looking at 10% of it. What's in the other 90%? And then here we found on June 10th, they just unveiled another fourth of it by splitting the curtain. Interesting stuff. But say, when you look at stuff like this, and you say, how could it possibly be that somebody thousands of years ago could write about vision, or somebody thousands of years ago could write about the angles of life? Look what it says about the tribe of Judah. In Numbers chapter 2, verse 9, what does it say? It tells you how many people are in the tribe of Judah. What is the tribe of Judah? The tribe of Judah are the children of light. How many people does it say is in the tribe of Judah? In Numbers chapter 2, verse 9, 186,400, which is the constant speed of light. Who put that in there? Who put that in there 5,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, whatever you want to say? Who put that? But you say, how is it possible? That people thousands of years ago. Let me give you a scripture as we wrap this up. And then next week, right here, a really big show. Next week, we're going to do the seven seals. And we're going to start showing you the basic structure 
of the seven seals, Moldara, Anastana, Manapura, Anahana, Vishudi, Ajna, Zahara, connected to the sacrum, the sexual, the solar plexus, the heart, the throat, the head, and the pineal, connected to the discovery of the seven planets, Pegasus, Virgo, Ursa Major, Cancer, Boots, Andromeda, Leo, connected to the horse, the seven seals of Revelation, the white horse, the red horse, the black, the pale, the earth, the silence, connected to the seven months from September and October to March and April. It's really, really stuff. So we'll get to apply all of this stuff. And then you could say, you really are nuts. And then, but I mean, that, that's all right. That's fine. That's fine. There's no problem with that. Okay. But let me just show you this. Let me get rid of this. How could it possibly be how could it possibly be that people thousands of years ago could write the stuff that's coming true and you're seeing today in this evolved um, state of mind that we're, we're coming to? I want you to look at this final scripture. It's on page 567. And I really, really like you to look at it. It's in Ecclesiastes. Okay? Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 9. You might want to... We can read it together. You're talking about wisdom, Albert. You're talking about people who knew. You're talking about now we have Hubble, and now we, we know about the cosmos and the universe. And, and remember, well, I'm, I'm calling it Supernova 1987A. But remember something. That thing didn't happen in 1987. The light reached the Earth in 1987. I mean, this happened 167, 267,000 years ago. But what does it say here? In Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 9, I love it. The thing that has been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. Is there anything new whereof it may be said, see, this is new? It has been already of old time, which was before us. Love it. There is no remembrance of former things. Neither shall there be any remembrance of things that are to come with those that it shall come after. In other words, the cycle keeps repeating itself as people begin to learn and learn. You're on a planet. And look at you. Go home. Look in the mirror and see what you've accomplished. You have been as a human race on this planet for 500,000 years. And it took you 499,900 years to make a light bulb. What the heck were you doing here for 499,000 years? Not made a light bulb 100 years ago. Because you've reached that point of evolution where you can make a light bulb. And suddenly something happened. Could it have been an angle of light that triggered a gate inside of the brain, the computer? And then what happened? Now listen to what I want you to think of. You're here on the planet Earth. You've made your light bulb 100 years ago. What about something that lives on the planet in 4555 that made their light bulb 5,000 years ago? Where are they? Where are they when it comes to teleportation? Where are they when it comes to the understanding of science? And we, as Dr. Zellinger says, are so primitive, but if they live in a different... The guy last night said, well, what about aliens? I said, well, how dare you, aliens? Because somebody lives in another neighborhood, you call them an alien? You call somebody who lives in Australia an alien because you've never seen them? They just live in a different neighborhood, just live in a different place. But they have been impacted by the same light 5,000 years ago, and you're just getting yours now. So you think you're so smart because you got Hubble. What have they got? And then take a look at the guy sitting or the girl or the lady sitting next to you. How do you know where they come from? Because those people know how to teleport, bang, bang, just like that. You don't need the speed of light. You don't need spaceships. You just go. I'm gone. We must arm ourselves. They're coming. No, we must prepare ourselves and let's get the hell out of here. <laughs> Thank you. It's good. We'll see you. Bye bye. <laughs> I was